as I got ready to leave the campus, I went by to get pick up my orders, and I looked. I said, "What do you mean, my orders to Korea? I can't. I can't go to Korea. I just got married, you know." So, uh, uh, the colonel said, "Yeah, yeah, that's where that's where you're headed. You're headed to uh, uh, Korea." So here I am. I'm I'm at Washington. Linda's up here. I've got to go up and tell her. We, uh, uh, I've got to say hi. Graduated. We go. We go to. We get to go to, OB, uh, to the basic course together, and then I'm headed for Korea for a year unaccompanied. And I, I had a lot of leeway as a 22, 24, I guess, year old second lieutenant. There, I had, I had a, a lot of leeway to to demonstrate what I could do, and my job was to train uh, our guard posts, who were the early warning guys out there for. Uh, uh, the um, in case the North Koreans decided to come south, and so I every day I was into my vehicle. My driver would pick me up. I'm into my vehicle. Um, uh, we're ready to go into the zone. We go into the zone. The zone was still considered a demilitarized zone, and uh, we could only do certain things in the zone. But every day that I was there. I carried my basic load of ammunition with me. As I came into the uh, to the zone, I was armed. My driver was was armed. If I took my recon sergeant with me, he was armed. We were all armed uh, going in, and plenty of ammunition. And it was a good thing because uh, uh, it was not unusual for some people to get sniped at and and to be uh, um, uh, even uh, uh, confronted by the bad guys uh, out, out in that zone, even though they weren't supposed to do that. So we considered the zone as a combat area. As, as a young lieutenant, I, I, I was able to get the uh, uh, position as the aerial observer for our uh, uh, battalion also. An aerial observer, uh, I'd go down uh, once or twice a, uh, a week and fly the zone uh, with and observe what's going on in, on the other side of the uh, uh, DMZ, and of course that was that was so much fun to do that because again I emphasize that the, the the youth that's there. Um, my warrant officer that usually f uh, flew me uh, was I, he he's the same age as me, maybe any younger than me. He was a young uh, captain that had the the company, the aviation company that, that supported us, and so we'd go hopping. Well, we did it in an L19, the Bird Dog fixed wing, two seater, uh, uh, the, the uh, main driver sat in the front and then there was a, a back seat uh, for that and that's where I, I would be in the back seat. And we'd fly the zone and you're watching certain things over there, you know what, this, what it looks like and you know good and well that, 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 that there's artillery pieces back there and there's some place you can't see them and all but, you, but that's what you're trying to observe is, is any movement, any change. And, and that's what uh, we would be looking for. And, uh, so I was ready. I, I wanted to go. I, I, uh, I knew how to handle myself. I knew how to handle um, uh, whatever job they gave me. I was a captain at this time. Uh, that, uh, I made captain uh, in 24 months from going on active duty. 24 months later, I was a captain. And that was, that was fast. Uh, normally it was 18 months to first lieutenant and then another two years to to, to captain but uh, because of the need for captains uh, they did accelerated promotions I, I was the brigade uh, fire support officer so my job was to run the the TOC the, the tactical operations center for the artillery um, while we're um, uh, during the daytime I did most of the daytime and, and, and some at night worked my 12-hour shift is what I did and then uh, with the uh, uh, with that 12-hour shift my primary thing I stayed on was to brief the old man the brigade commander on the field artillery stuff uh, early in the morning as uh, as he came in and then late at night when he when he left first last thing he'd do is come in and get a briefing and then the next thing he did in the morning was come in and get a briefing I, I did both of those briefings and uh, uh, that was about the extent of my uh, work there, because we were still we, we still weren't uh, really into the hot stuff. We were just uh, uh, training and uh, 
getting getting ready for that. So I wanted to, 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 to get into the to the fray, and the best way to get into the fray is to be uh, in the in one of the maneuver battalions. Now a brigade is fine because you know everything's going on because everything's happening in that brigade is going on right there, and you know what's happening. But uh, to get to where you're really at it, uh, you need to be in a maneuver battalion. And the first of twentieth, uh, the uh, fire support officer for the first of twentieth was available. So uh, I told the old man, yeah, I would, I'd love to do that. I, I want to go down the first of twentieth, and uh, uh, so they let me do that. And I met my uh, my uh, my driver uh, down there. Of course, he wasn't a driver for me. He was just another guy working at the top with me, the tactical operations center. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, then my uh, my sergeant, fire support uh, sergeant. I met those guys out there, and they explained to me how how we work. And I met the battalion commander. Interesting, Tank, battalion commander was Colonel Beers. B E E R S Beers, Colonel Beers, and of course his call sign that he kept the whole time was Budweiser Six, <laughs> and so he had on the back of his uh, uh, flying helmet thing uh, that Budweiser uh, logo, okay. <laughs> and so he was he was a good one to know. But old Budweiser Six, great guy, really great guy, and. Um, uh, he, he was a hard charge. He worked just like I like him. I mean, you didn't you didn't quit until it was done, and you, and you started early, and, and you went at it, and and so many things I, I had I'd seen in in him how he operated his battalion, and he was good to his battalion. I mean, he he operated them, and we worked. We we re really worked. But I always had my flat jacket with me. I always had my weapon with me, my radios, my maps, and and all that, because you never know when the old man was going to say, okay, let's go. And we'd head out, and uh, you didn't know where you're coming back, or if you were coming back. Um, we'd hop on the the C and C Charlie Charlie. Uh, it's a, a command and control, uh, and we called it the Charlie Charlie. The one time that that uh, that I, I remember, uh, I guess it was the worst worst LZ that that I that I was in. Uh, uh, we had we had. Uh, Illuminated or gone in, we we designated the, where the, where we wanted to land, and then we pulled out. Well, after the first one landed, it started getting hit, and we could see over here to our right front, we could see a, an an old anti-aircraft gun, a shooting there onto that LZ, mm -hmm. and we hadn't seen it before because he hadn't done anything. He hadn't he hadn't, he hadn't made himself known. So I just turned to the three. I said, "You see him?" He said, "Yeah, I got him." And the three's already talking to the FAC. And, and the FAC, yeah, the FAC, I, I see it. So the FAC got on it, the forward air control, got on it, put F4s right, right in the middle of that thing. <laughs> I always thought that, that, that guy, he's, man, I've got these guys. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, getting, them, I'm getting them good. And then he looks up and sees these, sees these F4s rolling in on him. And with those 500 pound bombs, uh, he, he didn't last long. Every day was a combat day in Vietnam. So you you know you know you never uh, uh, you never were off your uh, guard because you didn't know whether you're going you're on a, uh, you're where you're staying for a while somebody snipes at you or, or then the night starts with with mortars and, and and all that and then we had in our position uh, my battery this this is when I had the battery I, I uh, halfway through uh, I had done the job for the first of twentieth as as their fire support officer. Then I was given the uh, command of the firing battery uh, at that time. That's at uh, 5th of 206. When I first got to Vietnam, we kept up with how well we were doing by the number of kills we got. And um, uh, you think about it, in a conventional war, you, you keep up with how you're doing by how much territory you got. In a conventional war, you, you use your FIBA. A forward edge of the battle. You, you you keep moving your FIBA forward as you're moving forward. So we've conquered all this land. That's how that's how you tell what you're doing. But when you're in a situation where it's not conventional warfare, you don't know uh, uh, how you're doing because of the land you got. That didn't make any difference. So the way they originally kept uh, uh, kept up with how well you were doing in um, um, there was by the number of kills. And, and artillery, infantry could do it, artillery did it, like um, 
like one uh, one thing uh, that I can remember specifically, they told me they told me that uh, there was some new ammunition that they wanted me to shoot, and we wanted to get a target for it. And so uh, he wanted me to have uh, at least two guns uh, uh, ready to go with with that new ammunition. And the new ammunition uh, was was these bomblets, the Kofram, we call Kofram round bomblets that round goes out, air burst and, and uh, spreads all those little things down. They go down, hit the ground, and they bounce up about chest high and go off. Um, so I was to shoot that at a target that we could evaluate. And uh, uh, we did, we got the target, we shot it, and then in order to verify, we uh, had to send a platoon out there to check, the, uh, check what was left, and, and we got the body count out of that. That's the way we did most everything, to get body count. We'd, we'd send somebody in afterwards to do a BDA, a, a bomb data assessment. But we got a card game, and we got going just bigger in Dallas. And we got one of those where you get a huge pot of money up there. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm looking good because I've got the winning hand. I really have the winning hand. And, you know, we got a blanket sitting out there and got all that stuff on the blanket. And... Uh, and, and I've got the winning hand, I'm ready to, to, to I mean, I'm talking about hundreds of dollars, and, and for a guy that, that kept uh, $5 in his, uh, of his paycheck uh, for a month, uh, to live on that, you didn't have a place to spend it, a couple hundred dollars, that's, that's a lot of money. And so I'm already, I'm ready to throw that dude in, and what happened, you would not believe, at the, about the time I'm ready to drop that thing and get, all hell broke loose. I'm not kidding you. That's when Tet started. They started hitting us with everything in the world, and then we got us scrambling. And so you know what happened to the money? The money, all that went uh, flying off the deal, and we're all uh, trying to find a place to keep uh, from getting a mortar on top of the head. Uh. The night that that happened, I get back, I got back over in my talk, and to, to start whatever we could do to get this thing corralled. We didn't know what was happening, and. Um, had four reserves out there and they were calling back in and said, you cannot believe it, these guys are, they're in formation, marching in, just throngs of them. Intervention. I really felt like that God had, had, had led us uh, to where we are and where we've been uh, very visibly because the guy that I was, is, and, and uh, I, I uh, was not the brightest uh, uh, army guy and all that kind of stuff, just, just worked hard at it. But the Lord saw that I got the jobs that I needed for me to to uh, to uh, move on into uh, higher places. I was in civilian clothes, didn't have my uniform on, and uh, walked up to the main building, the front of the main building where I was. You got to understand, uh, at Saint Norbert College is an old, old Catholic school, so all the buildings were were old buildings. But uh, I walked up to Old Main, and in front of Old Main, where the flagpole was there was, was a fire going. And some students were out there, uh, had a fire burning there uh, on the ground. And I couldn't figure out what they were doing. I walked over to them. They, were, they had a book, and they were taking the book. And uh, taking a page out and burning a page at a time in that fire. And uh, so I walked over to find out what it was. What it was, the year before, they had dedicated the uh, uh, annual to the ROTC department. And this was their way of uh, protesting the... Uh, the war in Vietnam. You can do just about anything you want to do. It's, it's according to how hard you want to do it. And, and it comes maybe not being the brightest, the smartest person in the world, but uh, the one that's willing to work the hardest and work hard at what you do to, to accomplish. Um, uh, that, that was always my mantra because uh, uh, I, I never could stop a job, quit a job, you know, I, I, you just got to go, go at it hard. So my, my advice is um, uh, an eight-hour day shouldn't even be in your vocabulary. So you, you work and get it done.